So good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, uh, to be here today. Uh, I am Dr. Ajay J. Seelan, and uh, I will be moderating uh, this session today. Uh, as they say, uh, good physicians treat the disease, uh, disease, and the great physicians treat the patient with the disease. With that in mind, uh, I would like to welcome the president, Dr. Kumudini Jayasinghe, and the committee and the members of Sri Lankan College of Internal Medicine, and also would like to uh, welcome our own uh, College of GPs of Sri Lanka, uh, our president, Dr. Matthews, our secretary, Dr. Dilni Baranage, and our council members, and also uh, all the members of our college, and also all of you who, who have be, who are here today, a warm welcome today. This particular CPD is being combinedly done by the Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine with the College of GPs of uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, and it's obviously on the topic that is in front of you, leptospirosis, which I think it's uh, a talked about topic now. And I think it's an apt topic at this moment. To start the proceedings, I would like to call upon uh, Dr. Kumudini Jayasinghe, who I personally know for a very long time, who I've worked under the VPOPD clinic, Candy. Madam, it's over to you uh, for a welcome address. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ajay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the Sri Lanka College of Indian Medicine, uh, it's uh, my great pleasure to welcome you all to the symposium on leptospirosis organized by the College of General Practitioners of Sri Lanka in collaboration with the Sri Lanka College of Indian Medicine or SLSIM and identifying the importance of knowledge and prevention of leptospirosis uh, SLSIM, with the support of the epidemiology unit, has started some awareness programs on leptospirosis to doctors and to the public. This is another such program where three experts will be sharing their expertise with the general practitioners today. I greatly appreciate President Dr. Matthews and Secretary Dr. Dilini and the Council of CGPSL for facilitating the collaboration with the SLSIM and uh, the CPD committee of uh, CGPSL for organizing the symposium. And last but not least, my appreciation goes to my good friend, Dr. Ajay Jaisilan, for coordinating and moderating the event today. Hope this symposium will enlighten you all on leptospirosis. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Madam, uh, for that uh, uh, brief but uh, uh, up-to-date uh, uh, on uh, whatever is going to happen today. So thank you very much uh, for also accepting our invitation. Uh, also, on the absence of our president, Dr. Matthews, I would like to call upon our secretary of the College of GPs of Sri Lanka, uh, Dr. Dilini Baranage, so to say a few words. Dilini, over to you. On behalf of the College of General Practitioners, I would like to uh, thank the Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine, the President, Madam Jai Singh, and the rest of the team. Thank you very much for the collaboration with our college. And uh, I hope uh, we will have uh, many more collaborations of this nature in the future as well. Mm -hmm. And we greatly appreciate your commitment and uh, your uh, invitation extended to our college. And I hope our GPs will learn a lot today. We have a host of uh, resource persons lined up today. So. Uh, Without uh, taking much time, I would like to hand over the proceedings to Dr. Ajay Jayasilan, our very own GP, uh, to continue the webinar. Thank you very much, Madam. Thank you very much, uh, Dilini. Uh, and uh, I think uh, it's time to slowly start. Uh, 
And the first uh, resource person will be Dr. Tushani Dabare, Consultant Community Physician, Epidemiology Unit uh, in Colombo. And it will be on uh, 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 evolving epidemiology of leptospirosis in Sri Lanka. Uh, and uh, uh, he also uh, is the committee uh, physician at the national focal point for leptospirosis, especially in the epidemiology unit of Colombo. So over to you, madam. Thank you very much, Dr. Jayasila. And uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I'm uh, grateful for the College of uh, Internal Medicine and the College of uh, General Practitioners. Uh, this is a, a very much uh, uh, needed topic at the moment. Uh, May I share my screen? Hopefully. Hopefully, uh, you all can see my screen. Yeah, yeah, we can see it now. Right. Okay. okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Today we'll be talking about the epidemiology of leptospirosis and how we test evolved over time to the uh, this level that we have seen. And uh, we will just talk about leptospirosis, uh, uh, what uh, the current knowledge uh, about the bacteria. It is. It will be a, just a short slide presentation. And uh, this is a spirochete. And uh, there are over uh, 250 known pathogens, uh, pathogenic serovars, and uh, we are discovering more and more each day. And it is thought to be one of the most widespread zoonoses uh, throughout the world. And uh, as uh, far as we are concerned, although it is a non uh, actually a neglected uh, tropical disease. It is a global emerging pu uh, public health problem at the moment. People have recognized this is underreported, most of the time sometimes misdiagnosed, and this may mimic communicable diseases of international concerns like yellow fever and malaria, which is really alarming. And uh, when you see this map, you can see the in the worldwide situation, the low resource countries are mostly at risk. The tropical and subtropical areas of the world, uh, we see the highest prevalence and Sri Lanka is known to be one of the countries with higher, high prevalence. And uh, this may mainly contributes, this uh, map will show that this will contribute uh, to the disease burden of the world, where mostly the economic uh, implications are seen with the agriculture and the food uh, production. When uh, it comes to transmission, the reservoir host is actually the uh, rat. Commonly, the disease is known in Sri Lanka as Miuna, but there are many uh, mammalian species including cattle, dogs, and pigs, and maybe sheep, horses as well, which is implicated. But research is scarce and we need more data. And when this uh, bacteria is excreted in the urine from an infected animal, it has an environmental reservoir as well, and it can survive in the fresh water up to 16 days, and in the soil for nearly 24 days. So it has an environmental reservoir as well, and it enters our body through the breech skin in a uh, person with abrasions, cuts, or fungal infections, cracked heels, or from the mucous membranes. So the uh, actually the risk uh, behavior such as washing the face, uh, drinking water, washing the mouth, from contaminated water is implicated uh, in this transmission uh, cycle. And uh, the clinical features, so when you are talking about epidemiology, 
uh, mostly those days what we thought of as leptospirosis was fever with jaundice and renal uh, manifestations. Uh, but in this uh, evolving scenario, we can see there is a wide variety of uh, clinical manifestations and it can range from just flu to serious and uh, fatal disease. And uh, a person uh, presents with fever, headache and chills. And what will happen, people will think that a person who gets a fever and headache, it could be either dengue or maybe some other viral infection. Hardly anybody ever thinks of leptospirosis uh, when he is confronted by a person with those symptoms. And uh, sometimes they have conjunctival suffusion and severe muscle tenderness. And the case fatal rate will range from 5% to 30%. But again, with the uh, underestimation, this could be very much exaggerated. And the uh, shifting of the clinical picture is seen mainly in Sri Lanka. And we see pulmonary manifestations with serious disease in many of the cases. So we need to think about this. And when managing cases, it is not always dengue, and it is not always fever, jaundice, and renal manifestations. When it comes to leptospirosis, there could be many other uh, forms of uh, uh, symptoms which will uh, actually uh, play a role in leptospirosis. It will be discussed later with the other speakers, but we need to uh, look at the epidemiology to understand what is happening in Sri Lanka. So over the past few years, we see a number of cases, the numbers increasing uh, due to awareness, due to increased uh, agricultural activities, and maybe some behavioral changes and other uh, aspects as well there are some more risk factors we need to consider. This is mainly considered, a, uh, in the past, it was considered a disease actually uh, known uh, with regard to paddy farming in Sri Lanka. Uh, so we usually concentrate mainly when a person comes, we, we will ask whether he's a farmer or whether he is exposed to paddy farming, and that's it. But nowadays we see the picture changing. Although majority are the patient may have exposure to the paddy uh, farming, uh, we think that the situation is changing because of the current economic situation and other factors. Uh, the epidemiology the, and the socio demographics are changing. Uh, at, a, in, at any given time, uh, we have number of notified cases and the highest numbers were reported in 2020. Those are notifications from the hospitals, the government hospitals. So many will be uh, in the uh, ground level uh, in the field with just flu uh, symptoms, fever, headache, and maybe they'll be okay after three days without any medication. And those are actually, uh, which we will be contributing the underestimation. And in the hospitals, the underreporting is also there. So what you see here, the numbers you see here may not reflect actually what is happening. It may be more than three times uh, the uh, number uh, shown here. And uh, those uh, factors, like uh, underestimation and underreporting, uh, it uh, unlike dengue, uh, the diagnostics and the interest is uh, they 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 have a sort of a very um, contrasting uh, interest uh, rates among the general public as well as the higher officials. However, as we were talking earlier, also this is uh, called a neglected tropical disease disease. And uh, uh, this uh, disease, of course, uh, is although the clinicians are really 
uh, troubled by this due in their day-to-day uh, -day activities, the data does not reflect most of the time what they are going through. And uh, as you can see, we see the numbers increasing during some uh, months in the year, although the cases are reported uh, from January 1st to December 31st. Uh, we see an increase during March to a, uh, May, and then again from September to October, uh, December. Uh, this year, we uh, the red line is shown. We got a uh, sort of an early increase uh, due to the rainfall patterns. And uh, in the districts, what we can see uh, usually uh, due to the reporting patterns and uh, due to the uh, behavioral and other occupational uh, patterns, uh, we see number of districts uh, having increased number of cases. Uh, Ratnapura, Gaul, Kaluthara, Kegol, Monaragala, Matara, and uh, Gampaha, Purunagala, those districts usually show an increased number of uh, cases uh, compared to the other districts. However, we have to remember with the underestimation and underreporting, this may, may not be the true incident. This may not show the true picture at all. We know that for a fact that in some district, leptospirosis, although they are treated, they are suspected and treated, all the things are being done, but they are not reported. So unfortunately, uh, what we get as data may not be seen uh, as the true picture. Uh, but what we uh, all have to understand is that the whole country is at risk due to uh, actually uh, what we can see, the economic and the other factors and the revival in uh, agriculture plus uh, the uh, hardships that people are going through uh, Redu reduction in the use of machinery in the paddy fields, we may see an increase in other districts as well. So we may be already seeing that, which is not apparent in our data. And the pathetic situation is we what we see, the economically active and the young productive males in the country are getting affected with this uh, disease. Uh, so those who are actually between ages of 20 to 60 are getting affected. And even the case fatalities are seen among those uh, young active groups. And of course, uh, uh, the, although the data shows that the farmers, the paddy farmers are more at risk, we see that many other categories are there uh, students, uh, gem miners, other uh, laborers, and even doctors, midwives, public health inspectors, military. So all are at risk. And it may not be just the farming that is at risk. Just one incidence of like uh, getting into a contaminated water source may give rise to leptospirosis. So we have to be really careful and uh, interpret our data. And we can't just say this uh, at this moment that only the farmers are at risk or maybe uh, the people who are exposed to the paddy field. This, is, uh, this should be borne in mind. And when you see a patient with uh, fever, uh, always think of leptospirosis as well. And again, the case fatality rate. Uh, we talk about dengue, we talk about uh, other diseases, but uh, the case fatal rate due to leptospirosis is very, very higher than any of the other diseases. Uh, you see every year uh, around 150 deaths are happening. Uh, as again, I'm saying uh, there is underreporting. There, there may be more than 200 if we truly get the picture and none are confirmed. Uh, through laboratory uh, diagnosis. And uh, this is a, a very alarming situation, even uh, the, the, uh, those deaths and uh, the serious cases, they need uh, 
uh, you know, like a variety of uh, uh, management uh, systems, which will impact on our hospital system if this uh, increases. So when we do our death reviews throughout the country, so we have been doing the death reviews and district reviews, what we see that is that the majority of deaths at the time of presentation to the hospitals, they have spent more than four days, more than four days after the onset. And uh, they have been seen at least once by a medical officer uh, in the primary healthcare setting. And uh, this is uh, actually what we see from the deaths. So it is true for other, um, uh, other uh, the cases as well. And nearly 60% of the reviewed deaths uh, showed that the people died of pulmonary complications. And this is a very worrying situation because it involves lots of uh, care uh, other than uh, what we thought about the, in the leptospirosis uh, management. And uh, this is uh, clearly a deviation from uh, the deaths in the past. So this is very important to understand. And I hope uh, that this, this could be taken into account when the primary care uh, doctors see the patients in the field. And uh, just for interest sake, I, I want to show you some data regarding the deaths in 2022 and the first quarter, that's the first three months of uh, 2023. Uh, so already we have seen uh, the number of uh, cases uh, and the deaths are increasing due to the awareness of the uh, medical officers uh, regarding the importance of notification and the deaths are also being notified. And uh, when uh, we see the deaths and when we see the number of cases reported, there is a, a big discrepancy, but however, at least we see that there are a number of uh, deaths that have, and they have been revived and all the reviews are uh, actually uh, giving us positive findings and uh, showing us where we need to ramp up our management in the prevention and control as well. And who is at risk? So the paddy farmers, obviously, gem miners in some districts and sand miners, people affected with floods. So during the uh, rains, we see a number of people uh, with uh, uh, leptospirosis increasing, the sewerage uh, workers and the people who actually do some maybe recreational, maybe occupational uh, inland fisheries. And we have to remember the housewives so when we get the data, when we analyze, we see that the housewives who go to pick the kohila and uh, other kira from the uh, those uh, uh, kohila kotu and kira kotu, they are at risk. And uh, the children uh, who go to play in the paddy field, they are at risk. We see a number of cases. And uh, the worrying trend, uh, the ecotourism uh, and the tourism, uh, we have to remember that our country, we are promoting all that. Unfortunately, we have to remember that leptospirosis is also there. So we have to be careful when we uh, intervene. And the prevention, uh, other than the general preventive measures, uh, protective uh, clothing and uh, protective equipment is very essential. And uh, of course, the prophylaxis. So this is not the only uh, prevention method, but for the control purposes, we need to uh, look at this. And prophylaxis sees uh, for high risk categories of the paddy farmers only. So please remember that. And the dose and the duration, we give the paddy farmers 200 milligram a week uh, for four to six weeks, six weeks for cultivation and two weeks for actually uh, for uh, uh, harvesting. And we can't give doxycycline prophylaxis for less than 12-year kids and pregnant and lactating mothers and those who are having any allergies. And uh, this is uh, an area of this thing, uh, contention. We have to uh, stick to the, uh, actually the guidelines when we are 
giving prophylaxis. You can't uh, give over the counter or uh, you can't give everyone because there is a, a space like the uh, duration is there, dosage is there, and the people who has to uh, take is specified in the circulars. And notification of leptospirosis is mandatory and you can sus like notify suspected leptospirosis cases and this is very important to understand the epidemiology of the disease. And I thank you uh, for the opportunity given. Uh, so I hope uh, that we can discuss this fruitfully and uh, understand the situation. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, madam. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for that uh, very uh, enlightening uh, presentation. I think uh, the audience would have obviously gained uh, quite a lot of knowledge uh, on that aspect of it. We'll leave the questions, madam, for the end of the uh, uh, session uh, because uh, we, uh, we are continuing with the remaining of the presentation. Uh, basically, the next uh, presenter, uh, he will be talking on the clinical manifestations and complications of uh, uh, leptospirosis. Um, and uh, he's uh, Dr. Vimalasiri Ulwa, Ulwa Tage, consultant physician, teaching hospital karapitia. He's an expert, obviously, in the management of leptospirosis. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, am I? Uh, can, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, first of all, I must thank uh, College of General Practitioners and uh, Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine for organizing this very important and timely uh, presentation uh, topic. So, let me. Yes, so my topic is uh, leptospirosis, clinical manifestation and complications. So I'm going to elaborate on the clinical manifestations and complications. <clears throat> so as clinicians, first of all, we should uh, think why we should uh, talk about leptospirosis. And uh, from the uh, epidemiology point of view, actually, Tushani mentioned how important this disease is, especially in the back, in the context of Sri Lankan uh, environment. And uh, from the clinician's point of view, it is becoming more and more a problem for us in the uh, hospital sector. And because it is, uh, why should we talk about leptospirosis? It's a common cause of acute febrile illness all over the country. Wherever you practice, you go to, uh, go to uh, for your practice, you will come across this uh, condition <clears throat> as a coming as a very acute uh, febrile illness. So, as uh, Tushani, men uh, Tush Tushani men uh, mentioned, the annual leptospirosis accounts for more than more deaths than dengue. It's, it's becoming yearly, this has been shown. And uh, uh, with underreported, uh, heavy underreporting, still uh, leptospirosis uh, deaths are more than uh, dengue. So one of the important uh, aspect or one of, one of the important message that I want to highlight for all of you is that the disease called leptospirosis has changed recently. And it is changed in all three aspects of the disease, its epidemiology has changed. As, as you can see, the, it has been considered as a, a disease of rural uh, community, but it's not so now it is, it has migrated to urban areas as well. And as demography of the disease has changed. Earlier, this uh, disease was thought to be a, a disease of children, but it is not uh, a disease of adults, but it is not so. We can see a lot of uh, children are coming to our hospital with leptospirosis, especially school children. 
due to various uh, sort of unexpected uh, exposures, they end up having this uh, condition. And the clinical picture also has uh, changed. So that, 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 that is the most important aspect of this disease because, because of that, most of the doctors who are not familiar with this, this uh, change is uh, going to miss this condition. So the clinical picture has changed. There are more and more severe forms of uh, organ involvement we see. And out of that, the pulmonary involvement is a very significant uh, uh, organ involvement where the mortality is quite high. So with that, I'm going to uh, describe, I'm going to uh, give you a, a discuss uh, a case scenario to demonstrate as to uh, what we may mean by uh, the disease change, the changes that has happened with leptospirosis. Yes, uh, this is a 13-year-old school girl, uh, previously healthy girl, coming from uh, Badegama near to uh, Goal. She was presented to uh, us with five days history of uh, fever, headache and body. Exactly, this patient was managed in the pediatric sector. And uh, during uh, early uh, illness, the, in the first few days of illness, she has uh, taken treatment from a uh, general practitioner. And uh, actually her mother is in abroad. And at that time when she uh, presented to general practitioner, this patient has not had any respiratory or urinary symptoms. And, but there have been a history of uh, mud contact or exposure to a risky environment. They have given that history to a general practitioner. And, but uh, our, with the treatment from the general practitioner, actually this patient's condition has not improved. So because of that, uh, patient was taken to uh, teaching hospital Karapiti on the fifth day of illness. At the ETO of uh, teaching hospital Karapiti, uh, the ETO staff recognized that she was in respiratory distress. Her uh, respiratory rate was more than 30. She was tachypneic, and her peripheral saturation measured by the digital um, uh, the, uh, oximeter showed that uh, it was low. And accordingly, she was put on uh, high flow nasal oxygen. And then uh, the hemodynamically also, she was not stable. She, her, she was tachycardic and her blood pressure was 90 by 40. And she, didn't, she needed IV fluids and IV noradrenaline to uh, remain stable. And the chest x-ray was taken because of she was dyspnea. She was dyspneic. And chest x-ray showed bilateral changes of uh, basal changes. So with that, since the patient was acutely ill and in respiratory distress, patient was straight admitted to the straight away admitted to the uh, pediatric ICU, and we are her respiratory distress continued, and uh, because of that, the oxygen uh, therapy was continued, and later on, the chest X-ray showed bilateral diffuse patchy patchy uh, suggested to be pulmonary hemorrhage. And during the uh, ICU stay, uh, it was found that lepto IgM antibody was positive. So it was confirmed a case of leptospirosis. She was uh, uh, hemodynamically, she was became more unstable and she needed uh, continued noradrenaline support to remain stable. And with that, uh, she showed uh, ECG changes, uh, the, the changes were persistent, and uh, she developed some arrhythmias later on. And troponin also became positive and it was very high uh, on the, uh, during the illness. And apart from that, she had evidence of severe oliguric acute kidney injury, starting from creatinine uh, more than 200 to and it went, went up to 700 later on and needed uh, hemodialysis also. And <clears throat> apart from that, uh, later on in the disease, many other organs got involved. It was actually a... Uh, uh, multi-organ involvement. And there you can see that uh, this uh, oxygen, I mean, respiratory distress indicate that she was having a pulmonary involvement, most likely pulmonary hemorrhage. And uh, this hemodynamically unstability and uh, is uh, high troponin shows that she was having leptomyocarditis as a complication. And apart from that, 
she had evidence of uh, multi-organ involvement towards the latter part of the illness with a severe uh, renal failure. So it was ultimately multi-organ involvement starting with uh, electropulmonary hemorrhage. So late, uh, on the sixth day of admission, she was uh, she uh, she was un, uh, she, uh, her respiratory distress was continuing and uh, she need, she was intubated, and uh, unfortunately her fever spikes was continuing and she was, became further unstable and she had a pulseless VT and had a cardiac cardiac arrest on the following day, and the postmortem revealed that it was the dominant organ involved was lung. It was severe pulmonary hemorrhage and some evidence of multi-organ involvement. So this case shows, uh, actually this case demonstrates, showcase the, the change of the disease that has taken place uh, in the recent past. So, uh, so what is the significance of this case? The leptospirosis in a 13-year-old school girl. So that shows the change of epidemiology as well as demography of disease. And you uh, otherwise, uh, I mean, it's quite unlikely that you would uh, suspect leptospirosis in a, this uh, a, a school girl of a, this age. So that is the uh, message that we want to con convey to you. So, uh, and the second thing is the presentation. Obviously, uh, the first, uh, the doctor who uh, encountered this patient wouldn't have suspected leptospirosis because even though uh, she was uh, uh, mentioned that she was exposed to the uh, high, uh, high risk environment, but still patient's uh, presentation on not that of a typical leptospirosis. So because of that, probably uh, early uh, diagnosis would have been missed. And thirdly, the cause of uh, death is pulmonary hemorrhage rather than uh, the average uh, a doctor would think that the leptospirosis is a disease of liver and kidney. Now, the, the cause of death would be related to any of these organs, but it's not so. The cause of death is here, the pulmonary hemorrhage. So that indicates that the clinical picture of this uh, condition has changed. So clinical picture, then the epidemiology and the demography of this disease has changed recently. So that is the most important uh, message that we want to convey to you. So traditionally, uh, we were thought that uh, the uh, leptospirosis is uh, two forms. One is the milder form where uh, the more than 90% of uh, patients are mild and they are appears to be, I mean, thought to be an ictery. When the patient is become ictery, we were thought that, we were thought that it was the severe form of leptospirosis. It is called Weil's disease Weil's syndrome when, uh, when there is a classical triad of uh, joint disc renal impairment and bleeding diseases. So, but the newer thinking and the, 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 when, when, uh, the, the way the patients have been presented, we can see that this, this picture has changed. The clinical picture depends on the organ that are involved. And if the uh, dominant organ involved is pulmonary, then the patient will end up with pulmonary symptoms. So one thing you need to remember is that patients with severe leptospirosis may or may not be ictery. And none of the organ in the body is immune to leptospirosis. That is also another message that you need to uh, remember. So it, uh, depending on the organ involvement, it may be renal, hepatic, cardiac, or pulmonary, or it, it may be any of these combination. But one thing again has to remember is that there is a very high mortality associated with if there is a, a pulmonary involvement, it's said to be more than 70%. And if the pulmonary involvement is uh, coexists with uh, renal and cardiac involvement, this uh, mortality rate goes further high. So little bit of pathophysiology is what happened in the acute kidney injury in, uh, that happens in leptospirosis. It's mainly two types. And this renal involvement hap happens quite early in the disease. Actually, uh, the first thing that happens is acute tubular necrosis due to direct toxicity of the uh, leptospira uh, being present at the epithelial surface, the renal tubules. You know that leptospira can be found in uh, kidney uh, as they get infected, this is the first organ get affected. And uh, this indicates that 
the uh, importance of early treatment with antibiotics so that when you start antibiotics quite early in the disease, this uh, organism can be killed so that you can retard the uh, progress of the disease and uh, later uh, complications uh, also can be reduced by giving antibiotics. So that is the importance of early antibiotic treatment in this case. This is one condition where uh, the doctors been, uh, even the primary care doctors allowed to, even the house office in the hospital are allowed to start antibiotics straight away if you are suspecting a case of leptospirosis. So that is one thing again need to be remembered. So this early tubular necrosis that can happen even in the second day of the illness. So if you do serum creatinine in these patients on the, even on the first or second day of illness, you would see that there, there will be early rise because this early rise is because of this acute tubular necrosis, which is a product of direct of, uh, toxicity due to uh, leptospirosis being present in the renal tubule. So that is important to remember, especially in the, uh, uh, since uh, the, you are the first people to encounter these patients in the field. Secondly, the acute interstitial nephritis is the one which happens later on due to immune mediated uh, sort of uh, mechanism. That takes time actually after one week, the renal uh, injury is continued because of the, this uh, mechanism. It's an immune mediated mechanism which further uh, damage the kidney and impair the renal function. Apart from that, dehydration plays a very important role in developing acute kidney injury. So in the, in the field, in the, as a general practice a practitioner, I think it's very important that you remember these uh, factors. And uh, if your patient, you are suspecting leptospirosis, especially look for the hydration part, because if the patient is dehydrated, that will be an added uh, uh, impact or added uh, insult to the kidney. So be careful that, uh, remain, I mean, remind them to take uh, adequate amount of uh, fluid to avoid this uh, problem. So apart from that, phlebomyces also plays a, uh, a role in developing acute kidney injury in leptospirosis. Secondly, the myocarditis. Usually myocarditis is the uh, most difficult part to diagnose clinically. But uh, sometimes patient may complain of chest pain, but often pa patient doesn't complain of any chest pain or tightness. But it's mainly a diagnosis by doing ECG. So if you have any, uh, I mean, doubt, it's better if you can, uh, if the facilities are available in your facility to do ECG would, uh, uh, I mean, indicate and also help to diagnose this condition quite early. ECG ch changes are quite common and it may vary quite a lot of changes can happen uh, in ECG as, uh, in the ECGs, and it will be AV conduction defect or arrhythmias. And uh, later on in the hospital, usually echocardiogram and uh, enzyme, uh, uh, when, you, when you do troponin, often with the acute myocardial, uh, myocarditis, uh, the enzymes goes high, and that will further confuse the clinician because this picture is quite compatible or quite, quite telling with acute myocardial infarction. Even the ECG changes and the enzyme elevation also tells with the uh, acute myocardial infarction. Sometimes this may confuse the clinicians as well. So the exact mechanism of cardiac involvement, we don't know. So the pulmonary involvement, a little bit of pulmonary uh, involvement, uh, pathophysiology about the pulmonary involvement. This just to remind you, uh, the, uh, the uh, cartoon showing the uh, alveolus, normal alveolus. And we are, this is the same uh, thing in a, in a more uh, descriptive and histological type of uh, this diagram. We are, you can see this uh, greenish tapering uh, thing, which is uh, type one pneumocyte. And you can see this uh, alveolar capillary, which is with close proximity forming the most important uh, part of the lung, uh, as far as uh, the lung, uh, the function of the lung is concerned, that is alveolar capillary membrane. What happened in leptospheric pulmonary hemorrhage is there is a linear deposition of antibiotic and antibody complexes over this uh, alveolar surface of this uh, alveolar uh, capillary membrane, which exert a direct uh, effect, direct damage to alveolar capillary membrane, so that uh, this alveolar capillary breaks down and capillary opens into the alveolus, causing 
alveolar hemorrhage. So that is the basic pathophysiology of pulmonary hemorrhage. So pulmonary hemorrhage actually was not a, a complication when we were students, when we learned uh, about leptospirosis uh, a few decades ago. But later, at, at that time, the main uh, clinical manifestation was uh, the, of leptospirosis was uh, liver involvement and renal involvement. But this uh, pulmonary hemorrhage first reported in uh, 1995 in uh, South Africa, Nicaragua. After that, this condition of uh, increasingly recognized in other parts of the country. And even Sri Lanka, it has been reported in uh, way back in 1975. But after that, repeatedly, this has been reported uh, in many occasions in large numbers. And as uh, Tushani, uh, Mendes, uh, Tushani mentioned, now uh, the lepto pulmonary hemorrhage of leptospirosis has become the major cause of death due to leptospirosis in Sri Lanka. So. It, it, it should be highlighted that you should pay uh, extra caution when you are, uh, uh, I mean, encountered with suspected leptospirosis, look for looking for uh, features of pulmonary involvement. So what are the clinical features suggestive of uh, pulmonary hemorrhage? It's the, the first thing is that they become tachypneic, but they never, I mean, in, in the early stage, they don't know they, whether they have some difficulty in breathing. So they, they just have, increase uh, rate of breathing. But later on, they develop dyspnea. That is the sensation of being, uh, feeling some difficulty of uh, breathing. So later on, they might come down that they feel uh, short of breath. So this usually happens in the quite early in the disease and the fourth day of illness, this can happen. And because of that, looking for and uh, asking for these, these symptoms are also important even in the uh, general practice. So tachypnea is a thing that you need to uh, remember. Patient can might or might not complain of dyspnea in the early stage. But if you have a facility to check the uh, uh, digital, um, I mean, saturation with a, with a uh, digital uh, pulse oximeter, yes, it, it that will show uh, hypoxia. And later on, patient might complain of uh, coughing out blood, hemoptysis. This happened a little later in the disease, uh, nearly uh, as the disease completes one week of uh, duration. And after that, the chest X-ray infiltrate will show the uh, something like this. Uh, it may be uh, unilateral or bilateral, patchy shadows, small, start with small nodule opacities that may progress into a larger coalescent lesion later on, which we call cotton wool uh, shadows in the X-ray. Usually this, they are bilateral, but it could be uh, unilateral. Even it may not be uh, as florid as this, but it may be very subtle. But if you are very keen, you might catch these uh, changes. And usually they are bilateral and often inferior and peripheral. So pulmonary hemorrhage can be very severe. These are a few cases that we have managed in our ward. This patient, really, uh, you can see the X-ray involvement is very severe and uh, involvement, and you can see complete white out of the uh, lung field, uh, so that it uh, he had very severe sort of uh, pulmonary hemorrhage, and it was a very difficult case to manage. And this is another patient who came with similar presentation and started coughing out blood, and ultimately uh, he had a cardiac uh, respiratory arrest in the ward, and we had to intubate him. And when we intubated, this is what we saw. You can see blood coming through the ET tube into the bamboo bag as well. So this is another patient who was not uh, so fortunate to survive. And this is not the liver, this is, but this is uh, lung. So you can see the extent of bleeding that has happened to the lung. So it is, it can be very severe and it can be fatal. So as, as I told you before, it's only 10% uh, of the case, uh, uh, leptospirosis become severe and rest you can consider as mild, but it is very important to differentiate from severe cases from mild cases. So what are the features that suggest the severe uh, leptospirosis? Now, any organ involvement, like acute, uh, I mean, if, the, if there is a kidney, no evidence of kidney involvement or renal involvement, 
especially if the patients complain, complain of reduced urine output because renal involvement in leptospirosis is invariable. Almost always there is a renal involvement. But often if the case is not severe, I mean, if it is a mild case of leptospirosis, there will be just a uh, rise of creatinine. But no, uh, urine output is usually normal or perhaps urine output may be uh, uh, normal. Or sometimes they may be polyuric. But if the patient is, uh, if there is a suggestive history that suggests that uh, reduced urine output with uh, increased creatinine, that is very important uh, to recognize this thing. It indicates that you are dealing with a severe case of leptospirosis. Secondly, the, uh, the hypotension is a quite early indication of uh, severe leptospirosis. If your patient showing low blood pressure, which is persisting, so that is a very dangerous trend and definitely that patient is going to end up with a lot of complications. So it's be, you have to be take extra precautions and uh, send this patient to a nearest hospital where immediate uh, care can be arranged. Apart from that, uh, as I mentioned, any signs or symptoms suggestive of pulmonary involvement, tachypnea, hypoxia, hemoptysis, or chest CT infiltrate, uh, uh, indicates that pulmonary involvement that this indicates that it's a case of severe leptospirosis. If you happen to see some ECG changes, that's again that's evidence of myocarditis. So it's a, again a case of severe leptospirosis. So if you find any of these things, even a, a single uh, feature of these things, so you are dealing with a severe case of leptospirosis and usually their prognosis is bad. And usually they are the people who ended up with a lot of complications. So please, if you recognize any of these symptoms or signs or investigating evidence, please refer this patient to uh, higher care. So when to refer? As I told you before, the same thing I'm going to repeat. Uh, the sus if you're suspecting a leptospiral patient with atypical presentation like chest pain, shortness of breath, hemoptysis, or uh, having chest X-ray changes with a compatible background history, yes, it is a case of pulmonary involvement. Uh, so please uh, refer that patient to a uh, relevant uh, care. And any features suggestive of severe leptospirosis, as I just mentioned. And also, if the patient is, if your patient showing all the compatible history plus jaundice, again, uh, probably uh, it's better not to treat this patient as outpatients and please refer this patient to a uh, hospital. And other thing is, uh, children, if you're suspecting a leptospirosis in a children, it's better that these patients should be seen by a specialist or should be cared in a hospital. Uh, the other uh, category is patients with comorbidity. The patient is having diabetes and various other conditions like chronic kidney disease uh, or respiratory, uh, chronic respiratory problems. Yes, they are more prone to develop further complications and uh, the, usually their outcome is compared to healthy, uh, otherwise healthy patients. They, they are uh, prognosis is usually not good because of that it's better to refer these patients also to a higher level care. And if you find it's difficult to differentiate whether this, this is a case of being your leptospirosis, please don't waste time to refer the patient to the institution where the more care can be arranged. So with that, I conclude my presentation and thank you very much for your question listening. And I'm happy to answer your question during question time. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, uh, questions can come to the end and uh, we are a little bit, uh, unfortunately running out of time. Uh, so we will quickly have to proceed to the other one. Uh, so the next one will be Dr. Nilanka Pereira, uh, Senior Lecturer and Consultant Physician in Internal Medicine, Faculty of Medical Sciences, University of Sri Jayavadalpura. Her research interest, again, uh, includes this topic, uh, leptospirosis. Uh, so uh, over to you, Dr. Nilanka. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jaisalan. Uh, so I'll quickly go into my presentation because we are running short of time as well. I hope you can see the slides uh, at the moment. 
Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay. Great. Um, uh, so uh, again, it's very, um, thank you again uh, for being able to talk to uh, y'all the general practitioners, because uh, as you listen to the presentations, the previous presentations by uh, Dr. Zabrera and Dr. Luatige, you would have uh, realized that uh, leptospirosis is quite a common disease because it's probably underreported and underdiagnosed as well as uh, uh, it can lead to quite severe manifestations. Uh, but these patients most of the time present to you all early uh, during the first few days of illness. Uh, so that's a very significant role uh, of the general practitioner in managing uh, these patients. Um, so um, I'll just uh, talk about two patients and then we'll see, um, you'll realize uh, how variable these patients' uh, presentations can be. Uh, so first patient is a 49-year-old farmer from Gaul. Uh, presenting to the GP with fever, myalgia, lethargy for about three days, uh, having severe muscle tenderness. And of course, um, the GP also notes that there's a little bit of icterus on examination. And the full blood count that was done at the GP center reveals uh, a white cell of about 12,000, uh, significant neutrophil uh, predominance, and platelets are also slightly low, so 98,000. So, of course, this patient was uh, requested to get admitted uh, to Karabiti, teaching hospital Karabiti. And uh, while in the ward, of course, he develops AKI, liver involvement. Uh, so he's managed as leptospirosis and he recovers after treatment and is discharged. So this would be like a classical presentation. And uh, if you see a patient like this coming, a farmer, as, I, as we may, uh, talked about these high risk exposures as well, with all the other features such as myalgia and uh, even muscle tenderness on examination, icterus, uh, high white cells uh, with more neutrophils. So obviously um, the, the uh, suspicion of leptospirosis is very high. Uh, and uh, that would be very uh, important to diagnose or suspect as well. And then I would also like to share another patient who came to us at um, Columbus Out Teaching Hospital. Uh, so this was a 26-year-old, uh, previously healthy man. He came with headache, photophobia, and vomiting. So uh, he has had uh, quite a high-grade fever, again muscle pains, joint pains, about 10 days prior to admission. Uh, and of course, that has resolved after about three days. And uh, a GP has, of course, given an antibiotic for these uh, symptoms of uh, fever. And uh, then following that, he again developed uh, features of uh, meningeal irritation, so significant headache. And uh, on um, examination, he has uh, neck stiffness as well. So he was, of course, managed as meningitis. And um, lumbar puncture also shows uh, the proteins were normal, but there were uh, cells. Uh, polymorphonucleic leukocytes also about 13, more mononuclear cells. And um, although he was managed for meningitis, then um, the house officer who was quite keen also found that in the history he has uh, gone for wa white water rafting about two weeks back before the onset of all these symptoms. And uh, two of his friends also had a similar uh, febrile episode uh, requiring hospital admission. So this patient again um, had high white cells. Uh, but normal platelets, normal CR, CRP only mildly elevated, but liver functions, renal functions were all normal. And um, his uh, leptomat, uh, which was sent to MRI, uh, the first one, of course, was again had a significant teeter. So this patient, of course, had uh, aseptic meningitis due to leptospirosis. So this patient initially presented to the GP as well with this febrile illness and later on came with uh, this meningeal uh, involvement. So you see that um, leptospirosis can have quite variable presentations and uh, there can be many atypical features as well. And other thing is obviously this patient as well, when he presented to the GP initially, just fever, myalgia, arthralgia. So it just mimics any other disease, just another viral illness. It can be just, or even could be dengue fever. Uh, and sometimes sepsis as well. Any bacterial infection uh, might also uh, mimic uh, this presentation. Uh, so it's quite difficult sometimes in the early part of the illness to differentiate between all of these. And the other thing is the exposures that we discussed. So uh, as Dr. Luatage correctly mentioned, nowadays we don't see these typical farmers um, or that sort of exposures in our patients but we see patients coming with very subtle exposures. Sometimes it's just uh, 
in uh, around urban areas, sometimes these patients have just done gardening. Uh, they, are, they would have been exposed to a little bit of um, water in the garden, or they, um, they these can be children again who have uh, uh, played in a ground. So those are very subtle exposures. So unless we go into the history and derive this information, uh, we might actually not uh, think of uh, this exposure as significant, as well as we will not think lep of leptospirosis as a DD. So when should we suspect leptospirosis? Uh, so this is what the guideline, the guideline we have, uh, which was uh, published in 2016 say. So any acute febrile illness with any of these features, so either headache or it could be myalgia, um, prostration. Uh, of course, if there's jaundice, uh, that can be more uh, high degree of suspicion again. Uh, and these patients also can have conjunctival suffusion, uh, which can also occur in dengue, but it's most of the time the suffusion is much more uh, common or conjunctival hemorrhages are much more um, common in leptospirosis. And if they have organ involvement, of course, they might have reduced urine output. Uh, and the case that I mentioned, sometimes it's meningeal involvement. Um, and of course, they can have bleeding, uh, and uh, as Dr. Luwatege mentions, all that. So if these symptoms are there, at least one, and if you have also elicited an exposure, which might be suggestive, uh, and with or without other organs that are involved, such as the kidney or the liver or the uh, heart or the lungs, then of course we have to think of leptospirosis. And in primary care, of course, you might not see all these symptoms, but it could be just a fever. Uh, but one, some symptoms that might uh, point towards leptospirosis would be significant myalgia, which can happen in any other viral infections or dengue as well. Uh, but if you do elicit uh, muscle tenderness as well in the calf or the lumbar area, uh, that is also slightly commoner in patients who have leptospirosis. Then, as I mentioned before, conjunctival hemorrhage. Uh, and if they have icterus, uh, and in the investigations, if you find that these patients have high white cells, uh, mainly neutrophils with low platelets and high CRPs, then of course, these are kind of uh, classical uh, features that would point towards a patient who has leptospirosis versus some of the other things. But in, uh, at the same time, I would like to highlight these atypical manifestations of, as well of leptospirosis. So although we mentioned the classical symptoms and organ involvement, they can present with quite rare manifestations also. So they can have a lot of neurological manifestations, pancreatitis, so all these complicated um, systemic involvement. Uh, but of course, they would uh, then definitely present to a um, hospital as well. So di in diagnosing in the primary care, so when you see these patients, uh, then, uh, as I said, you, we need to have a high degree of suspicion if you, uh, if you have to think of leptospirosis. And uh, most of the areas, this is just one um, map that I uh, took from one of the published articles. So most areas have quite a high uh, burden of leptospirosis. And the dark colored, uh, the dark colored areas, of course, are um, the areas which has reported high numbers. And then um, we have to suspect in patients, as I mentioned before, in any acute febrile illness, if you have elicited a high-risk exposure. And if there are typical features that we mentioned again previously of leptospirosis, then do think of uh, this infection. And also, even atypical cases, subtle symptoms, also, if there is still a high-risk exposure, think of a leptospirosis too. And these are the exposures that are classically talked of. Uh, again, Dr. Um, Labrera like, nicely mentioned about these. Uh, so I will not go into detail. So oc certain occupations like gem mining, sand mining, and uh, farming. Then um, we see a lot of patients with, who go on recreational activities, sometimes hiking and these water rafting. Uh, we do get patients like that as well. And some people who just go and play in the paddy fields or any muddy grounds. Um, and uh, then uh, who, uh, like, especially we get patients from uh, people who work in the municipal councils, who uh, clean drains, and then again, who uh, are involved with um, sewage uh, cleaning and things like that, uh, as well as people who are exposed to floods. Um, then um, if there's, of course, 
contact with animals because most of it's not just rats, cattle, buffaloes, and in our setup, of course, dogs all can be reservoirs of uh, leptospirosis. So all these might be high risk exposures. So I think what is most important for you is if there is a acute febrile illness. Uh, so most of these patients, as um, Dr. Luwatiri mentioned, uh, only about 10% would develop all the severe symptoms and the manifestations we discussed. Uh, but most of them might be just having a mild flu-like or any febrile illness. They might even recover on their own, or they might recover with uh, the antibiotics that you give uh, for these infections and might not even need uh, hospital admission. But some of them might, of course, progress and develop more severe manifestations. So most common diseases that would mimic uh, in our setup, first would be any patient coming with acute febrile illness. So it can be either a viral fever or dengue. Uh, that would be our first uh, differential, I suppose. So when we do, uh, so the investigations that you all can do uh, in such a patient, the basic things, the full blood count, the C-reactive protein, and if you do have a suspicion of leptospirosis, a creatinine, serum creatinine might help you to differentiate some of these patients. Um, because in viral fevers or dengue, we would expect the total white cells to be low uh, and there won't be a neutrophil leukocytosis, uh, but there will be thrombocytopenia or low platelets. But in leptospirosis, most of the time, we either see a high normal or a quite a high white cell count uh, where the neutrophil percentage is predominant and the platelets are also low. So that might point towards a bacterial or an infection such as lepto rather than a viral fever. Then again, C-reactive protein also, most of the patients we see in the hospital have quite significantly raised C-reactive proteins. Uh, and of course, we expect that to be normal or uh, very uh, mild elevations in a viral fever. And creatinine again, um, some of these patients, uh, as um, Dr. Duvatki mentioned, even in the initial presentation can have uh, high creatinine levels due to renal involvement. So those in combination will tell you that it's probably not a viral fever or dengue that you're dealing with. It could be a bacterial or something like a leptospirosis. So that would be one way of uh, suspecting. And of course, there are many patients who come with sepsis, even urosepsis or pneumonias, all also might sometimes mimic these um, symptoms as well as same laboratory findings. So it might be difficult sometimes to differentiate, especially in areas where recursive infections are there. Again, they might have same findings. Um, so if you do suspect leptospirosis, uh, you can send diagnostic tests. Uh, then of course you might have to send samples to MRI or some private hospitals do the antibodies. And uh, if you have any doubt and if you're concerned about the patient's symptoms, if they think there's any uh, symptoms that suggest organ involvement, such as kidney, or any symptoms suggesting cardiac pulmonary involvement, uh, and you're worried, or if this patient has comorbidities and or kid, children, as Dr. Luwatagi mentioned, then do refer to a hospital for further workup. And if you do decide to see this patient as an outpatient, do the tests and you want to see um, uh, review, do review the patient regularly. So don't just give an antibiotic and then uh, uh, not review them. So important thing would be because their symptoms and organ involvement might evolve. So always, if you do decide to treat this patient as an outpatient, review the patient again. So these are the diagnostic tests that are done. Um, early, of course, we send blood for the leptospira PCR to MRI. And uh, if they present later, after five days or so, it might take even seven days, uh, then of course uh, we send uh, the blood to MRI or private hospitals, they do leptospira IgM antibody. Now, if you, there are these patients who do not have any organ involvement, just mild infections, they can be treated uh, by uh, the general practitioners as an outpatient as well. But the important thing is, as I mentioned, reviewing regularly to see whether they do get any problems as well as proper education of the patient. So um, if, if you're to treat, then the antibiotic is doxycycline that can be given 100 milligram twice a day for seven days. And uh, of course, amoxicillin and azithromycin can also be used, especially if they are in pregnancy or in children. 
And important thing would be to tell the patient that they should monitor and have a check on their urine output. And if there's a reduced urine output, they should come to and get admitted to a hospital immediately. And if they do get any of these symptoms, cough, shortness of breath, icterus, so all these things again warrant admission. So if you do suspect a patient to have leptospirosis and you think with probably with exposure and just a mild febrile episode uh, and your investigations are suggestive, but there's nothing to suggest uh, significant organ involvement, no comorbidity, comorbidities, then of course you can um, even treat uh, in the outpatient setting. So the next um, uh, area that I would just touch on is also about prophylaxis. So um, people who are at high risk, uh, who have had a short-term exposure, they can be given prophylactic antibiotics, that is doxycycline. So most of the time, uh, so this can be in two ways. Uh, it can be either pre-exposure or if they are exposed, for example, if they're exposed to floods, they can be treated again as post-exposure prophylaxis. So this evidence actually come uh, uh, from, a, from a study which was done way back in around 1982, uh, where these army soldiers who were training in Panama, there was a lot of um, cases of leptospirosis and um, these US soldiers, they were finding it difficult. Uh, so they of course uh, started giving doxycycline 200 milligram weekly for whole of the time they were there. This was a study again. And of course, they saw that uh, the number of cases were low. Uh, and it has been done in even endemic settings as well. So it can be a pre-exposure, as I mentioned, which will be most of the time decided by the MOH in the area and then uh, given uh, to these uh, mostly patients uh, such as farmers uh, and other high-risk groups um, as prophylaxis, which is doxycycline weekly. And also there's a place for post-exposure prophylaxis as well, which might be more relevant to you. Uh, so a patient after a high risk exposure, it is um, also, can, again, doxycycline can be given as a single dose um, as prophylaxis to prevent um, leptospira uh, symptomatic infections. Although the evidence is um, not very robust, um, it is something that we do practice. And um, so I suppose what your role in um, leptospirosis is mainly diagnosis because you will be seeing these patients early on when it's very difficult to say, actually it's leptospirosis where there will be a lot of mimics. So a high degree of suspicion is very important. Early referral in patients who have problems and who, are, who have any concerns do just refer the patients quite early and uh, educate also your patients uh, when you meet them about these exposures uh, and other problems as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nilanka, for again enlightening on us on, uh, I think, a very, very uh, relevant and uh, a topic that is talked about uh, nowadays quite a lot. Uh, in par with obviously, uh, you know, diseases like dengue and, you know, even it, it's so common. So basically, I guess uh, it's it was a very, very uh, good session for all of us. So is there any uh, questions? I think uh, all three uh, resource personnel are there. So we can allocate. Uh, time has run out, unfortunately, but I think uh, we can obviously allocate uh, a few minutes for questions. Uh, I see questions on the chat. chat uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, there's a question: AST or ALT will be high in lepto. How to differentiate lepto from hepatitis? Yeah, uh, yeah. From can, ALT. Yeah. Can I answer the question? Sure. Sure. Yes. Uh, now this. Uh, SUDPT can be high in many uh, OAs. To uh, can be high in many many instances, including dengue. It, most of the viral fevers, uh, leptospirosis, and hepatitis. So the uh, any patient with coming with acute fever and suggestive uh, history has to be taken into account. Now high acute high fever, body aches and pain. All these things suggest that patient is in an acute febrile illness. And as compared to in hepatitis, usually they are not, uh, not when, when their liver involvement is manifested, usually they are not acutely ill. So that is clinically 
you can differentiate them so that is uh, that is one way that is the important uh, uh, i think bit of information as to how to differentiate it clinically okay, apart apart from that you can do uh, whatever the other confirmatory test but there is a important uh, clinical differentiation and also I, if i add one to it we do see more of a ast elevation than alt in these patients because of the muscle damage as well is it dr rathi yes, yes you see more predominant ast elevation okay thank you uh, there are quite a number of questions i'll quickly go through i i don't know that we can do everything but there's quite a number of questions what are the long term outcomes of leptospirosis uh, such as meningitis liver and renal involvement fortunately again uh, the leptospirosis is, is a disease if you recognize it early and if you treat it properly the usual recovers fully and there is no uh, long term sequelae so there's a important message uh, and an important thing to rem remember because it is a treatable disease it is a tre it can be treated and it, they it's they usually they recover fully without any sequelae even the severe more severe cases of leptospirosis pulmonary hemorrhage they require quite well uh, with the treatment and uh, usually uh, a week or two later they are completely back to their normal physical state and even uh, myocarditis tends to improve quite early, i mean with the treatment and they are back to uh, their uh, normal physical being in a uh, few weeks time So okay. Right. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, since risk can be subtle, like even playing in the garden, when would you recommend doing the blood test when a patient presents with a uh, febrile illness? Day one itself, if there is a uh, like a, a subtle exposure. I think Nilaka, you can ask. Yes, and it's very difficult to say. It depends on the patients as well, like your clinical assessment. If you think it's just a viral fever, uh, probably you might not be doing a blood tests, all of that on the first day. But one important thing is, I think it's important also for you all to know whether you do have leptospirosis patients in your area when you treat as well, because especially if you now if you see patients and do refer to hospitals, try to see whether they do turn out to be lepto, then you will know whether in your area you do get cases or not. That is one. Uh, then you know that uh, these sort of patients do present to your area, and then um, secondly, um, now most of the time, if you you might need a count again depending on the patient's symptoms and the severity. So a count, full blood count per se as a basic test will be helpful. So depending on the patient's uh, symptoms and the clinical assessment, you can decide whether to do it on the first day or then review again. And there was another question about uh, reviewing how okay, often. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Doctor. Doctor. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, reviewing how often to review if you treat as outpatient guidelines recommend forty eight hours uh, to be reviewed okay. if you do treat as outpatient. Okay, right. Thank you so much. There are many questions. I don't know whether we can go through all this. Uh, okay, how much is the cost of uh, those types of immunological tests in private sector? I, I think it's. Uh, Like it's, it's it's private sector should be quite expensive, right? I mean, can it be uh, given as an amount or I mean rough? That's a question. Uh, I'm sorry, I cannot actually give the exact amount. Uh, okay, right. Okay. It depends can on I... the hospital also. Oh, okay. Oh, all right. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, so, what are the points we mentioned in a uh, patient? and travelers education about leptospirosis what are the points we mention in patient and travelers okay. education about leptospirosis uh, uh, i'm not very clear yeah. probably, can the person probably, ask it directly because, yeah yes no, it, what they want to get is that uh, what are the things that we should mention if a, if a okay. person going on a trip or somewhere Okay. And, okay. Uh, okay. Is what 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 clues and I mean, I mean what what things that we as doctors True. advise. True. Yeah. Right? So that's what the 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 person uh, the the question means. Probably. Um, 
Yes, uh, you can mention about the uh, clinical manifestation. I mean, early features like severe myalgia is a very important uh, uh, thing. And if the if the patient get this thing, and also it's very important to highlight that the kind of uh, exposures, like like uh, contaminated water or uh, even the uh, the muddy areas. And if 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 they if the person is uh, planning to travel, that kind of uh, getting exposed to that kind of uh, environment in, in, in during that uh, journey or trip or travel so it's it's uh, kind of uh, you can warn them that there is a possibility and if you do get if the, if the person is going to uh, develop that kind of thing uh, come to a doctor quite early and get the, the suitable treatment okay uh, thank you uh, can, uh, can a person get leptospirosis when contacted with excretory products of domestic mice. Sorry. Um, Except a yeah. person can they get leptospirosis when contacted products of domestic mice? Uh, actually, uh, if I may answer the question uh, from the special investigations uh, that we have received from the uh, public health inspectors who have gone to the patients. Uh, Residents and uh, interview the patient once he gets home. Uh, there were some incidences where the only exposure was either cleaning out a cupboard uh, where the rats uh, rats were in and uh, there were excretory products uh, as, or a, a space, kitchen space or storage. Uh, so there were some instances uh, where they reported uh, that they have been exposed to this. Uh, Domestic mice's. Uh, okay, so there is a chance. There is yeah. a chance. So, yeah. To add yeah. to that, I think uh, we have seen a couple of uh, patients who are coming from school children, especially coming from uh, after cleaning their school, uh, I mean, classrooms on the, on the beginning of their term. You know, this uh, place is quite uh, uh, contaminated or uh, uh, with these uh, type of things. So I have seen patients coming, school children coming after cleaning their classroom. So that indicates that uh, domis domestic mice is, uh, uh, can, uh, their excreta can be quite dangerous. I mean, uh, uh, of course. Okay. The if patient is being managed in the outpatient, how often should we advise them to come in for a review during the first few days? Or do we advise on red flags and review as needed? Yes. But I mentioned uh, you have to review in 48 hours according to okay. what our guidelines recommend. Uh, anyway, right. if there are flags, then you need to see anyway. Okay, right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I'll quickly go through other just few questions. I don't know. It's, I don't know that it's time. Is, is there any var uh, uh, like variations in epidemiology with weather changes? Like whether, whether there is any uh, weather changes can it affect? That's what I think uh, this person is asking. Yes, uh, with the um, onset of monsoons and with flood situations, we can see the number of cases increasing. And uh, specifically uh, in 2012, we saw a huge flood uh, in the Kurunagal area and the resultant uh, leptospirosis outbreak uh, with many deaths. So, uh, of course, okay. there is an uh, increase. And this year also, we saw the increase coming early, the outbreak coming early in March. Uh, with the onset of rains. Okay. Uh, is leptospirosis essentially a clinical diagnosis or is the microbiological important to diagnosis? It's a, it's a clinical diagnosis. Often, clinical. even if, if the patient comes to the hospital, it is a clinical diagnosis we depend on because this microbiological or the uh, special uh, serological diagnosis takes time. Yeah. We never lose okay. time. Uh, if you are suspecting uh, leptospirosis, so it's clinical. That's why we have this uh, whole idea of having this uh, uh, forum with you. Okay. If uh, I'll do the other questions quickly, if treating with amoxicillin and as oh, acetromycin duration of treatment is the usual five days and three days uh, respectively. Like what they're asking is amoxicillin five days, acetromycin three days, like for any other disease. Is it the same thing? That's what they're asking. So azithromycin, it's 500 milligram uh, daily for three days, but uh, amoxicillin, okay. you have to recommend a day for seven days. Okay, right. Thank you. Three times a day. Okay, right. Okay. 
So what they say, Mangsulin. In pregnancy and children less than twelve years, what is the drug of choice? Acetromycin. 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 Yes. Okay, right. for both, right? For both. Yes. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, last two questions. What are the risks of leptospirosis during pregnancy and antibiotics and treatment options? That. Like, what are the risks in pregnancies for leptospirosis? No, no difference. I think uh, it's the same kind of thing. And uh, there have been uh, reported cases of uh, pregnancy, I mean, uh, leptospirosis related deaths in pregnancy as well, due to pulmonary hemorrhage, as well as severe uh, renal involvement. So it's, okay. it's, it's common. Uh, it's, it, there is no difference between even the pregnancy. Yes, in pregnancy. In the right. case of okay, okay, right, okay, okay, sir. Right, thank you so much. So basically, uh, we have I have somehow covered all the questions that are asked. I think it was nearly ten, and I think uh, it was quite interesting because I think this is one of the highest questions also asked. Uh, so I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, the three speakers uh, uh, who were uh, really, uh, uh, you know, in par with the subject, and then. This gave us the main uh, things. And also, I would like to uh, thank uh, uh, President Dr. Kumuduri Jayasinghe and uh, the members of the College of Internal Medicine for collaborating with us for a wonderful session. And uh, as Dilini rightfully said, I guess uh, we should be trying to collaborate more uh, on CPDs and also, if preferably, if there's a uh, possibility for even uh, you know combined projects together. So uh, I would like to thank all of the all of you all who actually joined us today. Uh, it was quite a few, uh, quite a good number. Thank you very much uh, for uh, coming out on a Sunday evening to hear 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 us out. And I I hope you all had uh, a good session. And we'll be uh, hoping to see you all very soon with our next session. Uh, I want to leave you with something of Mahatma Gandhi, who told, "Be the change that you want to see in the world." And I think today's three lectures have made an eye opener for all of us to change our perspective about leptospirosis. Thank you very much. Good night and God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.